Hi, beautiful humans. My name is Stephanie. I'm your host on Creative Street. Today, I have with me Felicia. Uh, the host of the Velvety Truth podcast. Okay. Um, today, we're going to kind of pick her brain on creativity and what, um, like, just who she is, what she talks about in her podcast, and wherever our conversation takes us from there. So, yeah. Um, so Felicia, tell us a little yeah. bit more about yourself, um, about your podcast and what, you know, what are some of your favorite things about hosting? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I started my podcast like probably a month ago. It's called the Velvety Truth and it's pretty much about, uh, wellness, abundance, um, wellness practices, stuff like that. Um, I do talk about like skin wellness practices because that is like one of my things that I'm really into. I am a licensed cosmetologist, but I don't practice in public. I just keep my um, license current mm -hmm. and I would like to work from home. So that's one of the ways that I, I, I wanted to start the podcast because I wanted to give value in that way mm -hmm. while I could stay home uh, with my kids and I also went to school. I got a master's in gerontology, like the studying the process of aging. Mm -hmm. um, so I have some background in social service type of thing. Um, but in my podcast, I do talk about like ways we can put up our boundaries, mm -hmm. ways we can use rituals, like simple as like, you know, finding ways to like, relax or how to better our skincare routine or how to minimize stress in our lives because they all they all connect mm -hmm. you know because the skin is like the biggest organ on our body mm -hmm. and so it can be an indicator of stress or disease by you know, looking at yourself, like what's different from day to day. And so it could be just an indicator of a lot of things. Like if we have a rash, we know something is wrong. Mm -hmm. If our skin color looks different, you know, there's some, maybe you had an allergic reaction to something. So, and I say stress because stress can really like induce a lot of diseases or onsets of disorders, stuff like that. So mm -hmm my podcast is kind of like the format that I use is like, I'm your guide. I'm your coach in a way. And I help you relax or I help you find ways to um, lift up your, you know, your nighttime routine. Like mm -hmm. what do you do before bed? So these are the things we want to do before bed. We also want to make sure our pillowcases are clean on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Because why, you know, the oils and everything that we do, even if you like eat a good diet or like, you know, all that stuff, what we put on our face matters too. Mm -hmm. And where we put our faces. So <laughs> that's kind of, that's kind of like where my podcast goes, but um, I do my skin wellness episodes in chunks. And mm -hmm. then I do like mindset stuff in chunks mm -hmm. because I feel like you can't really separate. I feel like we're all, we're humans. We're all these things you know we're in all so, of them. exactly exactly so I'm trying to build community with the podcast I'm trying to connect mm -hmm. um because it takes time these things take time mm -hmm. and you have to be in it for the long haul with mm -hmm. podcasting um so that's my journey and like I'm I hope to be a wellness guide next year probably maybe I'll have my LLC up okay. um but we'll see how it goes. But yeah, that's my that's my purpose of creating the podcast. And also, like, if people can't afford, you know, like, coaching or, like, you know, they can get value from the podcast mm -hmm. of what, you know, you know, if they can do it themselves, that's okay, too. Um, but I would like to eventually provide, like, accountability and guidance for people that's 
to, to be affordable as well. So mm -hmm. that's like my passion project. So like Love the coaching <laughs> and the podcast and like connecting because honestly, like now that I'm older, now that I'm a mom, it was really isolating for me when I had to stay home with my son. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I don't really care to like, I don't, I don't really care to like connect with other moms per se. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you're a mom, then that's cool. I'm not one of those you know, you don't have to be a mom to like be my friend type of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I you know, because yeah. I feel like if you're, I feel like if people are non moms and, but they're around children and they act like a mom mm -hmm. um, in that dynamic and they know what other people go through, like, that's all that matters to me. It's, mm -hmm. you, you have empathy. And of course, it's different when you are a mom and you're going through it. But, you know, that's not my, my main reason like I, I you know I just want to have community whoever wants to be in my space mm -hmm. yeah you just want to connect with like-minded yeah, people like humans yeah, yeah. To create perspective and like mm -hmm. learn from each other um yeah because being a mom is only one part of me mm -hmm. you know what I mean so that's why the other facets of who you are really matters too because you're not just a mom mm -hmm. you're or you're not, not just doing the mom thing you let's say you're like me, you have other aspirations and you want to fill that void with people that connect with you in that way, like the creative part. Mm -hmm. Even though, since we're talking about create creativity, Stephanie, um, <laughs> I was an art major in undergrad. Get out of here. That's awesome. I, I was, but I wasn't the greatest painter, but I love painting. Mm -hmm. I was an abstract artist. I think my dad called me an abstract artist. I guess that's what it was because realism is so like easy to me. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I love it too, mm -hmm. but um, I've always been like an abstract kind of artist, but but I don't practice painting anymore because of the space and the chemicals. I don't have the space to do that. But so what I did was after I had my son, I started buying coloring books Okay. because just the act of coloring and like blending the colors, it, it really put me in the flow. Like it really put even my husband noticed like. I just like I just need like 30 minutes to just color it helps um, you center yourself yeah yeah and then before I had my son I taught myself how to make like cold press soap that's really cool. like bar soap that, that yeah, was a like, learning that's that really a, cool <laughs> I couldn't take a class like I took a Udemy class but it didn't really help but I was like you know I'm just gonna learn this on my own like I follow some people so and then I have a book so it's trial and error like anything. It's not going to be the best at first, but mm -hmm. I love the creative process. I love mixing oils and I'm a big oil girl when it comes to like your skin. Like I put out of avocado oil on my skin. I started off with olive oil, but I changed. And then, so I'm really into like keeping yourself moisturized and stuff like that. So I love the soap making process, but I just don't have the space or the time either. <laughs> but that's why, like, um, I admire like soap art artisans, like mm -hmm. small batch companies where they make skincare mm -hmm. um, or so. So that was like kind of my outlet at the time. Mm -hmm. And I sent some uh, samples off to friends. Um, so. Yeah, and then now the podcasting is like another creative outlet mm -hmm. in a way because you have to prepare for it. You have to decide what you're going to say, how you're going to do it, and to learn like all the audio stuff, mm -hmm. um, editing. So if I, okay, sorry to interject. It's okay. Number one, that is awesome. You make your own soaps, like, or you, you used to be able to like make your own soap. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I have to pick your brain on that uh, at another <laughs> okay. time because I I don't know a lot about that, but it's so interesting when like you see like the videos of the people blender. doing that. Yes, it's so cool. Yeah, um, I love it. How would you define like being a creative though? Like if you had to articulate what it means to to create something, right? Um, like you mentioned the flow earlier, right? And how just a simple act of shading in something, like it it did something for you. 
if you can kind of elaborate more on like that feeling what what did that what did that flow kind of do for you um like men I, I guess like health wise right uh mm-hmm. mental health wise mm-hmm. so when it came to coloring it just brought me back because I love color too so like the color reminded me of painting um it made me not think you know exactly what I'm talking about yes if you're an artist and you have a medium and you know you just go with the flow and you just create it you're not thinking about anything you're like meditating really Mm -hmm. it's a form of meditation there's so many forms um I think as humans we're born to create even though we may not think we are creative I think a lot of people are. Um, it's it's different when you call yourself an artist, I think. Um, but I think everyone can be creative because we find solutions to solve problems. So that's being creative. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, when I was making soap, I love the mixing and like knowing what's in my skincare. Mm-hmm. You know, like it doesn't have to be so complicated it doesn't have to be something that I can't pronounce um so it was nice because now as a mom I'm not a like a chef but I do most of the cooking I don't I'm not a I'm not like a chef or anything (laughs) but like it's kind of like cooking when you're making soap so it's like that creative process you're mixing you're pouring you know, you're heating stuff up sometimes, um, you're melting stuff, you're putting them in molds. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just the, the act of making something, mm-hmm. whether or not it's useful or not, it's the act of making and producing. I think that's what humans I are think meant that's to what do. We're, yeah, I think that's what we're meant to do. I think because you put it so perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, we cook, you know, that's a creative thing. Mm-hmm. You know, finding a solution for a problem or or looking other ways of doing something that's going to be easier, that's creative. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Or just so, making something new. Like you were saying, um, like when you blend in the stuff together, like the colors together, like you don't know what that really is going to look like until it's done. And I think that's one of the personally it's one of the fun things about painting and then being creative is like you're just doing something you don't know how that's gonna look at the end like you have an idea of what you want it to look but that doesn't mean that that that's exactly how it's gonna turn out and I think that's also like a really fun aspect of being creative and stuff um I agree so (laughs) so for my listeners I hope you guys know, like, I, I tend to have some questions pre-written down, um, but sometimes it, it doesn't make sense to kind of go with that flow. I'm just being completely myself and honest. So it's, uh, so I'm sorry if sometimes I, like, I get all, all weird. <laughs> I'm sorry to my guests. Um, you're fine. I think I would, I was telling you about this earlier. I, it, I get nervous and then I, I start rambling and, and do my uh my nonsense okay. things. Um I did want to know. Mm-hmm. So you you said you did uh undergrad art degree. Um were you so before that, do you think like you've always been like this creative person and creative in the sense that like you you always found ways to learn something new or to make something new or to like use these skills to find a new way of approaching something um yeah yeah so before that like I knew I wanted to learn more about like self-expression and I have an uncle that paints on the side and lives in this in San Francisco so he's a legitimate painter and he sells his stuff and and he had a brother that was into hair too. So I got it from that side and it just, yeah, I got, I got all the stuff. <laughs> and um, as a kid, you know, growing up, well, at the time I didn't know that I was highly sensitive and empath. Um, 
but I knew there was so much more that needs to come out. Like I, I just knew that intuitively, but I didn't know what that was going to look like. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, and I started drawing maybe, I don't know, for school mostly. I didn't really draw for myself. Um, it was like junior high. And so that's when I decided I was like, you know, and, and it's hard when you're a freshman in college, like you don't know Mm -hmm. what you're going to do. You can't, especially if you hadn't had like the proper guidance or how you can put your interest into something you can do as a job. So I didn't conform. So I just majored in art because I was going to cosmetology school around the same time a year after so my sophomore year mm-hmm. and I thought that that's what I was going to do and I decided to do cosmetology as a backup because I didn't really know what I was going to do as a degree or do with it mm-hmm. but I knew art was what I wanted to do at the time um, but I always knew there was yeah I think when you have perspective or if you want to share your perspective you want to like create and I think I don't know but I think in my opinion that it's Mm -hmm. common for people that are empaths or sensitive or um, have some sort of compassion there are many ways of creative as well Mm -hmm. so so yeah I don't know I knew since I was a kid I was always there was something that wanted to come out whether it's like writing or producing or making something so yeah I hope that answers your question yeah it does um I can't remember if it was now while we were recording or before that you mentioned you wrote a book I wrote a book did you oh no um I don't know if we talked about this but I didn't write a book but I was I I would like to write a book, a memoir. Ah, okay. Sorry. Maybe I, I, yeah. I might have, I might have uh, misunderstood or misinterpreted. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um. Okay. Oh, so you want to write a memoir? Interesting. Yeah. So I kind of started after I had my son. I have like a couple pages. Um. It's mostly that time in my life, the two years, mm-hmm. like right before I had him and right after I had him. Because it was a major, major turning point in my life. There was other major turning points, but this was the one that really shifted, like how I live my life now. I don't have a kid, but I can only imagine that that is a major change in one's life um, to become a mom. Like one minute, it's you yourself, and then. For me, I, I've always pictured like whether I have someone standing next to me or not, and it's it's me and my child against the world. Um, at at some point when I have my child, um, but yeah, I I can only imagine how how life changing that that must be. Um, kind of to get back on track though. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so. How does being a creative help you now um, in the podcast and with um, your coaching and wellness? So the podcast, so like I didn't know anything about podcasting. I didn't know, like actually I had a a small podcast of like seven episodes like two years ago, but it was just me. It was just kind of like a diary. (laughs) <laughs> a personal diary <laughs> I think we like, so I was like uh, I don't know I feel like I'm complaining a lot so I don't like how I'm doing that part maybe mm-hmm. I should switch so so I came to a point where you know the podcast is going to be eventually be more about not like more than it's like about me but not it's like I have a bigger purpose through the podcast Mm-hmm. so like being a creative really helps in finding how to do things mm-hmm. so I didn't know how to do a podcast like formally like like a hosting 
mm-hmm. saying a microphone and editing like I don't know editing like what like but the way that I operate and I'm sure you are the same we just get in there play with it mm-hmm. figure it out we don't really need like instructions per se unless we have a really big problem Mm-hmm. But as far as starting, um, it was easy to start. I just had to get a microphone and like figure out where, where I'm going to upload and do research on the hosting platforms. But being, I think being a creative comes natural to people when they just start anything and just play with stuff. I think people are just naturally creative in that way. Mm-hmm um because that's how I learn like you know I'm visual but I'm also kinesthetic so I need to touch it and like do it and like figure it out as I do it so yeah there's only so much more I can watch or listen I just need to get in there and do it figure it out Mm -hmm. um so yeah I think it helps being a creative with a lot of things in life how do you come up with like the topics like Mm. not literally like how but like like do you get do you feel like you get like inspired and stuff like when it comes to certain topics or like is it that you're doing something and then like it just like comes to you I think it's both Mm -hmm. um I think what I that some of the topics are the things that I've gone through Mm -hmm. and some of the topics are the things that I want to teach people like how to do better um so I've made yeah I've, I can I made a long list of topics already like 30 plus oh so. <laughs> uh, so yeah I mean because you know yeah I my initial goal is to be your accountability partner for your skin wellness but I I'm doing the podcast to encompass most or all things wellness only because when we are in that space of let's say coaching Mm -hmm. what you're going to tell me or hypothetically what you're going to tell me is not so much of the skin wellness part that you're lacking because that's the easy part you're going to tell me about your relationships you're going to tell me about maybe stress but i'm not a therapist so there's only so much i can't really you, I, you know, you're the client's going to tell me, but I can only be like a listener, like an mm-hmm. ear, a supportive person. So that's what mostly what clients may tell me. And that's why the podcast is the way that it is. Mm-hmm. I don't jump into skill and wellness right, right at the second because it's the whole person. It's the whole body. So the Mm -hmm. stress that we talked about earlier, it's, you know, simple as having a skincare routine, probably your relationships, the environment that you're in, even your job can affect the way you operate. Mm -hmm. It's how we, um, how do we relax? Mm -hmm. How, you know, what's your form of meditation? If you like walking, if you like reading, Mm -hmm. if you like taking longer showers, like, those are that's why I'm I was maybe was called to do the podcast because it's so much more even though yes I am your skin wellness coach but I want people to know that it's so much more and it it takes so much more um to navigate like yes I had acne when I was a kid and that's part of the reason why I want to do the skin wellness portion. But also I want people to realize it's not just the skincare you put on your face. Mm-hmm. It's not just the food you eat, um, which is a big part of it. But it's also how, what, you know, like, who do you talk to when you when you need something or need support? Like, how are you? I talk about communication. Well, that's like the boundaries thing too. That's part of communication. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I want people to understand that skin wellness is just not skincare and Mm -hmm. stuff like that, even though that's a huge part of it or a big part of it. It's your relationships. It's your environment. It's how you put boundaries up. It's 
how you sleep at night. It's, you know, it could be, you know, I do talk about like rituals and practices such as like changing your pillowcases and like stuff like that. Um, mm. You know, and the low toxic things like you use like a dryer sheet or whatever. Those are the simple things that you can fix. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, you know, when we look at it, it's like the whole person. I love that because you're absolutely right. Like we don't, we don't realize how much just the every day to day, right? Like maybe just going to your job and having all these um, exchanges with, with people, how much that can weigh on us. And then if you don't have your proper self-care, it's that it's like what you mentioned, it's not just the, you know, your environment, but even that internal self-care that you have, um, it all gets reflected into our skin. Like the the stresses, it bubbles up into like a pimple or whatever, into like a rash from all that stress that's accumulating in your body. Um, when you were talking about meditation practices, one of the first things that came to mind, my meditation is lights off while showering <laughs> with, oh, some, really? music, that's with nice. some music. Oh my God. Yeah. It's so nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Just I like, like that quiet time in the dark so it's like I'm not even I'm trying to limit the amount of sensory coming in so that I can have that peaceful quiet time that meditative um oh I love time. that mm -hmm. yeah um yeah. wish I had a bathtub to be able to do the the you know how they do like in movies with the candles oh I know the soak oh, with oh, all the like yes. yeah. <laughs> that'd be awesome I'd be doing like bath bombs all oh, the time I if I could I know um but yeah like I I love that you're absolutely right like and and that's not something when you mentioned earlier the pillowcase thing it was like I didn't even think of that you're so right like I should be changing out my pillowcases more often <laughs> so I mean it's the things that we do already but we just maybe mm -hmm. not do it enough mm -hmm. um because the cleanliness part is a huge thing mm -hmm. and not just like it's just hygienic, you know? And then when I talk about the acne, okay, yeah, we have acne. And then now we have low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And I had low self-esteem as a teen, even though people, you know, bypass, oh, you look fine. Oh, you look this. It's not really what they think. It's what you think of yourself. Mm -hmm. 100%. And, and that's why I like, it's kind of, that's why I kind of like, that's my vision of the podcast and mm -hmm. the all in one. So yeah, yeah. Even though we focus on the skin, but the skin the is skin just... helps your self esteem, and then it, which then helps reduce your levels of stretch, which then also helps reduce the skin stuff. It's a whole yeah. cycle. Yeah, it is. It is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love that. Um, one of the questions I have is, how do you incorporate creative process in your daily life? I feel like we beat that. <laughs> We did that yeah <laughs> we've done that yeah um you mentioned that your uncle is an artist and his brother is a hairstylist he was yeah yeah my yeah and they um and so they you feel like you got your creativeness out of that side of the family or that? i i think so yeah i mean yeah yeah um I think my uncle that paints, he's been painting for, for a very long time. He also has a full-time job. So, but he does painting as a passion and, mm -hmm. you know, um, but yeah, I think I got it more on that side. And then my uncle that was a hairstylist, he's no longer with us, but um, I met him like two times when I was a kid and he was the hairstylist. Um, so yeah, you know, I think things, ha I didn't know that I was going to do cosmetology um I was always interested in it because I didn't have a mom or I didn't have anybody showing me like beauty products and stuff mm -hmm. like that um so I figured stuff out on my own and um so it was just kind of like that I was just became my own like advocate for learning all the things that you know beauty stuff or like you know, or beyond. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Um, so 
originally I like to ask if there's anybody else in the family that's a creative, which we already kind of discussed. And I want to, I like to know is does that impact you? How did that impact you? Or do you even think like it did an impact to you at all to have these family family members that were creatives? Um, or yeah, that question. <laughs> um, I told you I'm a fool. <laughs> you're doing fine. Stop. Um, I don't know if it impacted me because I'm not too close to the family and so like I wasn't able to you know um I wasn't able to be like my uncles weren't like my they were not my mentor like I see them mm -hmm. I see my uncle like a couple times a year but I wasn't able to like be there and watch him paint mm -hmm. or um so I didn't really get mentored by my uncle but knowing that he is an artist I was like okay that probably got passed down to me and you mm -hmm. know and it makes sense. It gives you just like a sense of like a, a completeness or just like where it came from. Like, mm -hmm. so yeah, it, yeah, I mean, it gave me like a, like, oh, okay, I, I know why I'm like this because they're like that and just kind of like putting the two and two together. So it, you know, it made me like aware that I am creative and well, if I want to, I could be an artist too mm -hmm. and whatever that looks like. Um, it come, it kind of like, uh, so like it, like gave validity to your, do you think it's like, it gave validity to your creative awareness type of thing? Like, being like oh I'm so creative and it makes sense because like you mentioned like it, it grounded that sense of like completeness of like oh this makes yeah. sense my uncle is an artist so I yeah. should be creative as well or it makes sense that I'm creative right exactly exactly um and yeah I mean it just gave me that it just gave me like validity like you said and um and it's okay to be creative or want to be an artist or mm -hmm. um but yeah I mean and then on the flip side you know like I've had voices tell me you know you need a real job or you can't do that for a living and you know and, I'm, <laughs> and it's just it's very suppressing oppressing it's very oppressing mm -hmm. um yeah so so yeah, I don't know. That makes sense. I think there's something in our, I don't know. I, I, I could be just talking uh, like out of my experience, but I feel like there's something in our culture that tells us that following your creative passion doesn't necessarily mean to lead to wealth or to stability. It may lead... Mm. I like to argue that it does, but it just, it may not always lead to the wealth and the stability you're thinking mm -hmm. of. It leads to the internal wealth and stability. Like it, it, like you mentioned, like when you, when you get into that flow, you're not thinking you're just doing and you're being you, you're in that state of meditation in this state of like nothing in this world matters, right? Like and I think that that's really important to just our overall self-care, self-love, um, and just connection, right? Like you're connecting with something outside of yourself or like you're bringing into light something that only you can see in your, in your mind's eye, um, which then it can lead to physical wealth and, and stability, but I don't know. I, I completely agree. Like I, I resonate with that where. Yeah. I mean, like wealth doesn't really have to mean money. Mm -hmm. um, like my uncle, he works for pg and &E and he paints whenever he can, mm -hmm. you know, and he sells them and it's like, you know, you can still have a career. It could just be like your side gig or, you know when you're not working your full-time job 
so um and I respect that you know and he's still doing it um so I think finding ways to incorporate your creative process even though it may not make you money I think it's important because of course we have to be realistic yeah. you know at the same time <laughs> right. you know um and then well now it's easier for artists because they have social media and mm -hmm. they can do commission work and they can get exposed easier you know like I don't I don't know if I wanted to be like an artist like having my work shown I don't think I'm that type of artist I think I just enjoy the creative process and mm -hmm. just having it for myself and you know which is fine too or being in a place where people do it for fun like your art center that you want you know because it builds community it builds connections with people and opportunities that come along with it mm -hmm. um so yeah yeah. I love that. It's interesting how the different ways that we express ourselves as humans, how we we all find the same um feeling, right? Like it like if mm, I'm not saying this right, but essentially it doesn't matter what your medium is, right? And it doesn't matter if you're halfway across the world, halfway across the country, or right next door. Whatever your medium is, we all in the human sense seem to find some value out of this creativity. It's like you mentioned earlier, where it's like we were born to be creative. We were born to find unique ways of solving problems and approaching things and approaching these relationships in the world and um, creating these relationships between things so that you can make something new, right? And that literally can be said from something as, as abstract as language to something as real and physical as friendships and family connection to literal objects where you're piece, uh, piecing together things to make something new so it's really interesting how it really does seem like we were built we were like our our niche our our, our thing in this world is creativity is creation and I don't know like I mentioned to you earlier that I I've I went to school for psychology and anthropology. Um, I wanted to do psychiatry and therapy. I'm just, I'm not good with the boundary stuff, which is what your podcast is. Like, that's what I'm hoping that I'm going to like work on with your podcast and you're going to help me out with that. Yes, yes. Um, so with that being said, though, it doesn't mean that I don't love that mental health world. Right. Um. I just have a different relationship with it now as I've gotten older and I've, I've been more self-aware of what my limitations are as a person, be, as an empath, because that's the problem here, right? Like it's hard to make those boundaries because we are empaths, because I want to connect with you. I want to connect with you in a deeper level and I can't do that. I realized that as a therapist, you shouldn't do that. It's not okay. And I completely understand why it's not okay, but it doesn't mean that I like I can just change who I am. That's not it's not in me, and I sh shouldn't be asked to change who I am. Right. Um. Back to the point. Within the mental health world that I've I've grown up in and gained a lot of experience, like from my background, from my work background, I've noticed how depression and anxiety manifest, and how many times the the clients right they say they come in and one level at one stage in their life and then they they've worked with their with the therapist and then they they've shown up with like these new creative outlets right like journaling journaling is an example of that and how they're able to capture these moments these anxiety moments and 
these stressful moments and they were able to jot it down in a creative way to kind of release that. And I think that's what creativity does for us in a way. It's It releases some emotion within us, whether it's something super exciting or, or something super melancholic. Um, so after my rant, I always like to ask everybody, do you think creativity is valuable? And if so, in what sense is that value, right? And is there, well, I'll ask this, these first two. Is there value to creativity? Um, and if so, if so, what is that value to you? Like, what does that mean to you? Okay, so the first question is, um, what was does, the first question? <laughs> does creativity have values? <laughs> okay, we'll start. We'll start there. Does creativity have value? Yes, it does. Um, not only in the creative space, in the business world too. Mm-hmm. So, like I mentioned earlier, finding solutions or like looking at different things in a different way, having a different perspective, being open to different perspectives. That in itself is being creative. Because then you're creating an opportunity, a connection to something that's going to be better, something else. So, yes, I absolutely think being creative is vital. Like, for for example, I'm more creative than my husband. Sometimes when he makes choices, it's when um, I do things that makes it easier for us to accomplish something. And without me, he would have never seen it that way. Mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying so that's mm-hmm. another way of being creative okay. and um the second question what was the second question <laughs> if so what is what does that value I'll, I'll reframe it like what does that value kind of um mean to you you kind of mentioned it in in a sense but if you had to like define value right because the reason I ask when we think of value at least me, because of my upbringing, a lot of that time when, like, when I talk about wealth and value, it always has to tie in with money. It ties in with money. Just that's how my schemas are. It's it's uh due to my upbringing. It's a long story. I get it. No, I get it. <laughs> but in a sense, what I'm asking is, is that va- like what does that value mean to you? Like, what is the definition of value in this context? The definition of value, for example, like when I do my podcast, like we mentioned earlier, you mentioned my episode three. You really mm-hmm. loved it, and you loved it. you loved it, and that to me is value. Me giving you something that's going to help you, you know, time and time again, um, is valuable. Like. Even if someone like needed to hear my voice and think that it's like, I'm not saying like I'm amazing, but <laughs> you uh, are though. <laughs> you are though. So <laughs> let's make so that like, clear. So like, let's say my best friend says my voice is so soothing. I'm like, okay, at least they find it relaxing. At least it's you know serving a purpose. It doesn't necessarily have to be monetary. So now that I've gained some perspective in life. Value is not about money necessarily. Mm-hmm. You know, value could just mean like you, you know, had a bad day and you, let's say you're listening to my podcast and after that you feel so much better. That is value. That's giving me, that's, that's giving trust that you, the value is giving you a benefit and it's making you feel better and and in in return you trust me Mm -hmm. to create more value to help you so you know in 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 the sense of podcasting yeah that's what value is to me like that's why I'm creating free content for people and probably you the same Mm -hmm. so you know the value is is whatever we want it to be you know, whatever we take from it, if it makes us feel better, if it's going to give us some insight, new perspective, if it's going to help you connect the dots of whatever you were thinking before and wasn't sure, that's value. I love that. I love that. Thank you. 
um it's it's funny because and the reason i add okay context the reason i like to ask the value question is because in the process of doing research because creativity is is like this thing that scientists actually research right like research studies are done about this and so whenever you conduct a research study you have to like define how you're like what these words mean right and one of the definitions of creativity I came across while reading one of these research papers um, was that in order for something to be considered creative it must have value right Mm -hmm. and so this is what I'm this is why I like to ask this because my brain automatically always goes to physical value which in this case is monetary value but when I think about it more and the more I ask I realize that like I ask others I realize that when they say value I I always think to myself like value to who right like Mm -hmm. does it have to have value to somebody else or can it be valuable to yourself does that is that still part of that definition right like if let's say I make something and maybe out of the eight nine billion people that live out there in this world nobody finds a single value in what I created if I find value in it is that not being creative right right I think it's just one of those moments I'm rambling now, but no, (laughs) but yes. Um, So that's why I I just wanted to give a little bit more context as like why I like to ask that question of value. Um, Because I think like you mentioned, if you're able to create something that then helps me, right. That's valuable. But if in the process I create something and it also helps me like, relax that's also valuable right um so yes creativity valuable so yeah so to your point um i just want to interject so like the value doesn't have to be like transactional too like you mentioned if you create something for yourself and you find it valuable and you put it out there and nobody thinks nobody thinks it's valuable it's still valuable to you Mm mm-hmm because you had enough courage to make it to put it out there regardless if anyone has a reaction to it or Mm -hmm. finds it valuable to them Mm -hmm. it's still valuable to you love that what like what because that did something for you right 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 it exactly so it it goes back to the inner feeling right it goes back to expressing that inner feeling that we all have like this desire to to make something um oof (laughs) can you tell that like I'm not used to doing a lot of interviews it's okay I started yesterday we're all we're all we're all starting I started yesterday because we're we're used to being solo you know yes (laughs) for sure (laughs) um all right so if I'm being honest that's Mm -hmm. the that's pretty much the end of all the questions I had pre-written okay that doesn't mean we can't continue talking it's just in terms of creativity that's all the questions I had in mind there's one of the things I asked uh my public that at some point in life please send me over any questions you think would be (laughs) interesting to ask um anyways Mm. When do your podcast episodes release so that the audience knows? Um, when do they typically get released? They, as of right now, they typically get released on Saturdays, but it's going to change in November. Okay. So I, so starting November, it's going to be released on on Thursday. Okay. Yeah, I changed it because you know it's the day before Friday. People are just you know waiting for the weekend so it's like yeah I like that Um, yeah on the weekends I think everybody's out like at least in Miami over here everybody's out like party last thing I want to do is listen to a podcast I've been to Miami yeah yeah 2017 that's cool what area in Miami did you stay at oh we stayed in downtown because my cousin at the time was living in one of those um 
condo hotel thingy. I don't know. Mm, it's all skyscraper one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was nice. It was just, it was, you guys don't recycle. So it was just so weird. Oh, not at all. I, yeah. I'm from Cali. So it's like, oh my God, like you guys don't recycle. <laughs> I'm going to like blow my mind. Oh my God, we're putting it in the garbage. Like, whoa, whoa. Like, can you imagine my Armenians going anywhere else? That's mind blowing for us. It's like, oh, you guys recycle? <laughs> we don't do this. <laughs> Culture shock. <laughs> yeah. No, honestly, like leaving Miami, just, I, I want to say maybe what, like Fort Lauderdale, Dania. Once you get out of there, it's all kind of, nah, Dania, Fort Lauderdale, it's still okay. You're still ish, Miami. When you get to Orlando or Gainesville, I lived in Gainesville for six years um, while I was uh, attending school. And that was a huge culture shock to me. Like, what, what like, about it? No Hispanics. It, it, we, I'm, I'm so used to all constantly having like diversity around me. I went to UF. And for once, I didn't, I understood the idea of being different because in Miami, growing up here, born and raised, so diverse. You, it doesn't even cross your mind. It doesn't. It's not. It's to me. I like. I would listen to it in school, in high school, or in middle school. I'd learn about this, and I'd be like, "Why? Why are people so caught up with the like? We're all different. Who cares, right? No, you drive up six hours, and it was like, oh, this is real." And like now I understand how What's the demographic intent- there. There it was a lot of um Caucasian. A lot of Caucasian. Um and my at UF they had to make a unique program um called AIM, which was in order to increase the minority demographics that were uh in the university. Um, so it was only Hispanic and African American students, very little other culture students um, that were within that program that were allowed to get into the university. I think they've gotten better now over time, but when I got there, it was the first time that like I would interact with people and they would be like, "Oh, you have that Miami accent," and I'm like, "What? I have an accent? <laughs> I thought I was just speaking English." <laughs> Like, yes, I speak Spanish, but I didn't realize Miami have an accent. Miamians have an accent. It's the first time I ever heard of that. Um, and then I'm as, sure I have an accent too. If you do, I can't tell. I can't tell. I don't know. To me, a California it's just, accent. <laughs> not even. If you, like I said, like to me, if you do, I can't even tell because it's just, we're so. In Miami, it's so diverse and you have mm. so many different cultures and ethnicities and yeah. individuals that speak English and different mm-hmm. and with like different accents that I can't pick up on it. I can't tell you yeah. if you're from Cali, from Texas, from wherever. I I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I felt the same way when I visited Memphis too in my early 20s. Yeah. I was but- like, whoa. I was like, salt and pepper everywhere where are my brown folks where's my mexicans where's my asians but they were all nice though they're all nice they all spoke with a twang i loved it but i was like whoa whoa i was like whoa because in california we're just everything another melting that's another melting pot yeah so um but yeah i was just like whoa this is yeah different Mm -hmm. way different Mm -hmm. Yeah, I visited uh, San Diego like two or three months ago. I know you're not you're not from San Diego, right? No. Yeah, I I knew you were from Cali, but I can't. Sacramento, Sacramento, Sacramento. the capital. Sacramento. Sacramento. Never been to Sacramento. I've been to okay. L.A. and San Diego. L.A. when okay. I was like in middle school, oof. And all I could remember was actually I barely remember anything. It yeah. it felt like a downtown Brickell, Miami Beach area, like very high class. Like it's all high class. I don't know. That's that's San what San Diego's I, a lot prettier. San Diego is super pretty. Like yeah. I we visited the 
Oh, well, it was a little bit outside of San Diego. The vineyards, like up in the, I don't want to say they're mountains because I don't think they're mountains, right? They're they're hills. Hmm. Anyways, we we went to go see vineyards. It was really pretty. There's so many pretty like sightseeing. It's so hilly. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> this is beautiful. Coming from Florida, where it's, oh, it's a, it's so big, like it's just a tiny hill. Anyways, uh, but yeah. So Cali, Cali is very pretty. And uh, when we were driving around, like I saw the Hispanic culture, a lot of Mexican culture over there. It was a, uh, it was cool. It was a, uh, it's really interesting to see. Um, like I mentioned, it's another melting pot. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you got a lot of Mexicans in LA and in San Diego because California was part of Mexico at one point. So. Mm-hmm. Yep, and then as you get further to San Francisco, there's like a lot of Asian people, those types, because we came from a boat. Yeah, I mean, there was a time, I think there was like a lot of us from, well, my grandparents came here, um, I think in the 70s, I don't know. And um, because my grandfather at the time, he was like in the military or civil engineer, my grandma was like a teacher, so they needed professionals. Mm. from other parts of the world I don't know what that was called I think there was like a thing about it um but yeah have you lived in Cali your whole life like were you born and raised in Cali I was born yeah I was born in Livermore that's like near the Bay Area and Mm. I lived in LA for five years from 2010 to 2015 then I moved back and I've been pretty much here my whole life yeah that's really cool yeah yeah i am first generation everything (laughs) like my mom came from cuba my dad came from honduras and they met here in miami and history (laughs) yeah i'm first generation too yeah yeah first generation where'd you go to where'd you go to college when you were doing your undergrad and I went to Sacramento State, my undergrad. I wanted to go to Long Beach. I wanted to leave Sacramento. But I ended up here. Um, since my dad was a single parent, like it was pretty much paid for, undergrad was. But I had to pay for grad school. Did you and do then, Sacramento State grad school? No, I moved to L.A. And then... 45 minutes outside of LA was Laverne, a little town called Laverne. Laverne. And they had a Laverne University. So that's where I went and studied gerontology. They don't, they no longer have the program anymore because it was so small. Hmm. It was a private school. Um, but I like the area. It was cute. But um, yeah, I thought I was going to be like a case manager. Mm-hmm but realized I didn't want to do social work or social service because I was I um, was in it for a little bit working with adults with disabilities. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just, it wasn't, I don't want to do that work anymore. Um, so yeah, just trying to find my way and myself and I'll have a career at 40, isn't it? It's okay. <laughs> I, I'm I'm 38 right now, so by the time I'm 40, I'll be like rock solid. Yeah, it'll be fine. And, yeah. Eh. Everybody, yeah. everybody is on their own uh, journey in life. It's it. Don't look at others. Forget where they. No, are. no. Just focus on you. Yeah. Um. Oh, this is something I was gonna ask you, Karen. Are you still recording? Yeah, yeah. We're still oh, okay. recording. Okay. I mean, we could stop the recording, but <laughs> it's up to you. It's up to you if you want to use it. No, yeah, like I'm okay. Right now, I haven't. It's messy, guys, and I'm I'm speaking to everybody. It's messy, so some are gonna be longer than others, and if you're cool with that, great. And if you're not, well, let me know, and I'll we'll figure it out. But for right now, it's messy. So, and I think this is more authentic. This is more. I don't know. This is it's me. Yeah. Anyways. Um, I was gonna ask you for gerontology because that that's such an interesting topic, right? Like the process of aging, and 
I was in like, I told you I was studying psychiatry at some point. So I did a lot of like anatomy and physiology type thing. And so like the process of the cells and uh, all of that. So like, what would you say is the most fascinating, like a, a fun fact that maybe like you remember that it just kind of like stuck with you um, from gerontology, like from your time studying gerontology? Well, when I study gerontology, it's more like the social gerontology, um, mm -hmm. like basically, like we studied like death and dying, we studied um, like a policy class about certain things. Um, mm -hmm. Housing was a big thing for the aging. Mm -hmm. um, my, actually, my focus on gerontology was like sexuality and older adults. Oh. oh interesting yeah because um I don't know why I guess I just felt like because I have well I had three gay uncles so one died of AIDS okay. and I have two left and you know no one really talks about it like so I don't know what compelled me to really want to study that part but um because older people need love too and, and intimacy whatever that looks like it doesn't have to be sexual and housing is important because a lot of the sexual activity happens in assisted living situations mm -hmm. because you're in a group with like hundreds of older adults mm -hmm. um but what i learned that i didn't like about gerontology mm -hmm. is that it's so reactive so when I say that I mean like it could like whatever it could be it could be like financial literacy or nutrition like we always reacted to the like cause or the disease but we don't look like how like they lived their life before maybe mm -hmm. um so, for example, I'm going to go use the financial one because I think that's easier to explain. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, there's going to be articles about like older adults and like they can't afford medical care or, you know, they can't like save for the retirement or whatever. Okay, so why is that? Because people are not taught the right way to, one, save money, manage their money. Mm -hmm. Two, but we are living longer. We are living in our hundreds now. Mm -hmm. So people are expected to retire at 60 and live up to 75 and then fall off. That's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. We are living so much longer. So like I used to read these articles about hospital bills and financial stuff. And like we're not taught how to do it right. Like, you know what I mean? Like the medical journals are like so far behind. So mm -hmm. by the time they get published, it's like 10 years later. Mm -hmm. So that, that whole like idea can go or connect with like their medical history as well. Like, I mean, like you eat, I don't know, for example, eat steak and potatoes all day, every day and the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and then you smoke or whatever. Of course, that's going to have a reaction. And then I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> but it's like, like when you said, just, sorry to interject. No, uh, when you said reactive, what I thought of was um, like you're just trying to plug the holes, right? Like you're not taking a step back and seeing why it's happening in the first place instead of just immediately just trying to plug the holes exactly instead of taking the action to say okay this might be a problem in the future let's go ahead and start addressing this now so mm -hmm. then it doesn't become a problem so that you're not mm -hmm. last minute trying to plug holes mm -hmm. right that's exactly. what I that's what I thought of when you said like reactive like they're that's just what I meant yeah, mm -hmm. like they're just trying to immediately tackle what they're seeing now, but they're not doing anything in terms of preventative, right? right. Like trying to preemptively do things. 
Yeah. And I, I'm hoping that it's different because I haven't been in the field in a while, but that's what I was reading. And it just got me pissed off because this is why lots of like retirees are like broke and have to go back to work. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And like, that's why like young people also need to realize that retire saving for retirement is important (laughs) starts when they start working, Mm -hmm. you know, um, no one really teaches you that. Um, I mean, I was working when I was 18, but I didn't have a really good, you know, teacher in the house to help Mm me with, yeah, I need to save, but tell me why I need to save. Like, Mm -hmm. and, you know, put it somewhere where you don't see it every day. Mm -hmm. Like, I can resonate with that. My parents, yeah, they were, they were figuring it out. They didn't, didn't, they weren't even born in this country. They were trying to just learn English so they could figure it out. So I completely resonate with that. Um, and that's definitely not something that's taught in schools, like how to be financially responsible and what does retiring mean and all these, these things that you don't learn until you're getting maybe your first real job. I don't know. I'm, my first real job was at like 13, but mm-hmm not a point um like you don't realize that until you get into the the bigger corporate jobs where then now you have to figure out health insurance and uh retiring and uh, life insurance and this and that and like you're you're just overwhelmed that you're just like ah whatever i'll focus on that another time well Mm -hmm. in the meantime you're losing time that you could be accruing money towards Mm -hmm. your retirement Mm -hmm. and stuff yeah so it was that type of stuff. And like, I just, I don't know. I didn't really, I mean, it's helpful to know some of these things, but it's just the way the society operates. And so, Makes yeah, sense. I don't know. Makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, that's financial, but, you know, it could go into like other things as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because a lot of the baby boomers really, focus on social security because they think social security is going to be and save them and whatever. oh yeah no and i was like no you actually need social that's one part but you need at least two other types of savings at least if not more mm-hmm. so, especially with the way everything is like inflating now yeah it's pretty rough it is pretty rough yeah. um but yeah Yeesh. um so I don't know if you can tell in the background, but I got humans back over here. <laughs> so it might get a little loud. Um, so is it okay with you? We wrap this up and then we uh we're meeting again on the 23rd on your podcast. Yeah. So um everybody be on the lookout, part two, gonna be on Felicia's podcast, the Velvety Truth podcast. Um, check it out on Spotify. Um, is there any last words, anything you wanna say before we wrap this up? Um no, I'm I'm pretty good. Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me. No, yeah. Thanks for joining me. And you know, like I mentioned, I've said it once, I'll say it again. I'm a fool, guys. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Stay creative, everyone, and have a lovely Wednesday. Bye. Bye. <laughs>